Hey everyone, it's Colin, how's it going? The early 90s saw fierce competition in the new and rapidly expanding laptop market. Apple was no exception with its PowerBook line, so this time let's see what it takes to fix up one of its earliest budget-friendly models. The PowerBook 100 series was launched in 1991, and its three initial models were Apple's first attempt at making Mac laptops. The 100, 140, and 170 were well received, not just by Mac users, but also the computer industry as a whole, due to their innovative design decisions. They moved the keyboard below the display to create a palm rest for more comfortable typing, which also led to the built-in trackball. A lot of PC laptops at the time required an external pointing device. Apple iterated on the 100 series through the next few years, creating high-end models like the PowerBook 180 and also less expensive ones like the 145. This is a PowerBook 145B, released in July 1993, and was intended to be Apple's low-end laptop model. There's nothing fancy about it. The floppy drive is on the right side, and all of the I.O. ports are covered by a door on the back. There are connections for external SCSI devices, ADB for a keyboard and mouse, audio in and out, and two serial ports. The power button is hidden back here too, which helps protect it from accidentally being pressed, but also often led to the door breaking off or going missing due to excessive wear. A clever design element to these machines is their rotating feet that elevate the back for more comfortable typing, and while overall fairly boxy in appearance, they did tie in nicely with the design aesthetic of other Mac models at the time. When I first got this 145B, I pulled out its NICAD battery to find that it had started swelling and leaked a bit inside the computer. I disposed of it, but there was electrolyte residue left inside the battery compartment that I'd need to clean up. The bigger problem, though, was something I noticed on the back of the machine. One side of the display housing had separated, and in my experience, that only means one thing. There was a problem with the screen hinge. So that's what I decided to tackle first. I pried out the rubber screw covers at the bottom of the display bezel and took out the screws using a T8 driver. That's a tool I'd end up using a lot in this repair, as the machines held together almost exclusively with those fasteners. I leaned the screen back and carefully lifted the bezel to detach it from the clips at the top. Then I removed the four screws holding the LCD panel to the rear housing, followed by the last two screws at the bottom, and finally tipped the screen forward to lay it face down on the keyboard. Sure enough, my hunch was right. The standoffs where the hinges attached to the rear housing had broken off. Brittle plastics is an incredibly common problem with vintage electronics, and I've seen this specific failure in PowerBooks several times before. As have others in the retro computing community. So much so that I found someone had already created a model for a repair part on Thingiverse. The model was just slightly too big to fit on my 3D printer, so I modified it to just include the standoff portions and got them printed out. The brass threaded inserts had stayed in the hinges, so I removed them so they could be reused. This new bracket is meant to go in place of the old standoff, so I used a pair of flush cutters to trim away the broken plastic. Considering how damaged they were and that pieces of the standoffs were outright missing, there was no hope in trying to glue these back together. I used a piece of sandpaper to make the surface flat, as the fit between the rear housing and new bracket is fairly tight. If the bracket isn't flush, then the front bezel may not go back on correctly. I'm often asked why I prefer CA glue over epoxy when performing these kinds of repairs. 
The answer is simple. It's thinner and therefore won't interfere with the fit between parts. This particular glue is designed for use on plastics, and I've had very good luck with it in the past. I applied the activator to both the bracket and display housing, then put a few drops of glue on the bracket and set it into place. I had to work quickly to line it up the right way as the activator causes the glue to bond in just a few seconds. Thankfully, my aim was good, so I only had to wipe up a stray drop of glue. While the piece was stuck down, it takes some time for the glue to fully cure, so I left the panel to sit overnight. As a bit of an experiment, I decided to only replace the standoffs that were broken. I'm curious as to how sturdy these repairs can be, so since the other standoffs are still intact, they can serve as a control. I suspect I already know the answer, but if I get surprising results in the future, I'll be sure to share them. A cool trick I learned to reinstall the threaded inserts is to heat them up with a soldering iron. This melts the plastic and fuses into place very well. The glue bond between the bracket and housing is definitely the weaker link here. I put the foil EMI shield back in, but found that the new bracket interfered with the tab. I folded it to fit, and I don't think it's a problem that the screw holes no longer line up. The shield should still work just fine. Next, I put the housing back in place and reinstalled two of the screws through the hinges. It was then just a simple matter of flipping the screen back up and fastening it into place, then tucking the display backlight wires into their channel. I got the bezel reattached, but when I went to put the last two screws in, I realized I'd made a mistake and installed one in the wrong spot. So I popped it off again and moved the screw to the inside of the hinge where it belonged. No big deal. The front bezel went into place without a problem, and I got the screw covers pressed back in. And now for the ultimate test. Does the screen open and close as it should? Yep, just like new. And the gap in the plastics around back is gone now, too. Nice. I had two other things to take care of with this machine. That battery leakage needed to be cleaned out, and I also wanted to address the keyboard that had gotten quite yellowed over time. Both of these require taking the base of the PowerBook apart, so I did that next. I flipped the machine over and took out the four screws from the bottom, then turned it upright again and opened the rear door so I could remove the last screw hiding inside. Separating the top from the base is a little tricky. There's a ribbon cable connecting the two, but it's fairly short, so it's a bit unwieldy to pull out of its socket. The PowerBook 100 series started an engineering trend that Apple followed in many of its later laptops. The CPU was on a daughter card instead of soldered to the main motherboard. The 145 is powered by a Motorola 68030 running at 25 megahertz. It wasn't the fastest at the time, but still offered decent performance. By putting the CPU on a card, Apple could reuse the same motherboard across multiple models while still being able to offer different speeds. Indeed, the motherboard in this machine was labeled as being for the 140 and 170, and as far as I can tell, other 100 series models, like the 165 and 180, used it as well. The only real difference between the 145B and the original 145, which launched nine months prior in August 1992, was the RAM arrangement. The 145 had 2 megabytes of RAM on the CPU card with an additional 2 meg expansion module. But the 145B had all 4 megs soldered down, leaving the expansion connector open for an optional upgrade to its maximum of 8 megabytes of RAM. The battery leakage thankfully wasn't too severe and stayed in the front corner of the machine where there were no electronics to damage. It just took a little while with alcohol wipes and cotton swabs to clean it up as best I could. Considering the havoc that a battery leak can cause, I feel like I got pretty lucky with this one. 
Next, I turned my attention to that yellowed keyboard. It's attached to the top half of the power book, and I had to disconnect the trackball assembly and remove its two screws so I could lift it out of the way. Two flat flex cables connect the keyboard to the top case, then I took out the T8 screws from around its perimeter. For various reasons, I'm not a big fan of Retrobrite, so instead, I bought a replacement keyboard off of eBay. It was cheap, about $20 US, and compared to the one I was removing, it was in much better condition. And when installing it, I noticed something interesting. It had been made for Apple by Acer. Reassembling everything was uneventful. The new keyboard fit perfectly, and I got the trackball reconnected. I spotted a small amount of battery leakage on the top case and got it cleaned up. Just like with disassembly, it takes a little effort to get the ribbon cable reconnected, but since it's the only one between the two halves of the laptop, it could certainly be worse. In fact, despite being from the early days of laptop computers, this machine has proven surprisingly easy to take apart and repair. If only modern laptops had continued this tradition. I discovered an unfortunate chip in the plastics at the front, but in the end it's not noticeable since the cover for the battery compartment hides it. I'll have to be careful handling this machine going forward. So does the PowerBook actually work? Yep, it boots without a problem, which is a big relief. This 145B appears to be stock, with 4 megabytes of RAM and an 80 megabyte hard drive. I did notice something weird with the trackball. It had a problem moving the pointer up. Sometimes it worked, and sometimes it didn't. But there's an easy fix for this, it just needs to be cleaned. All I had to do was rotate the retaining ring to remove the ball, then I could use a swab soaked in alcohol to clean the dirt off the rollers. Since they're spring-loaded, holding them in place with a spudger made this process much easier. One thing I like to do with all the retro computers I get is to reinstall the operating system. The 145B doesn't have an external floppy drive port though, so instead of using my floppy emu, I had to switch to actual floppy disks. To make a set, I had to pull out another of my retro machines, a titanium PowerBook G4. It's a great so-called bridge computer to make transferring files from the internet to an old machine much easier. This one is set up to start into Mac OS X by default, but can also dual boot OS 9. From there, I could run the disk copy utility to build a set of System 7.1 floppies, which is what my 145B originally shipped with. The Titanium G4 is an interesting machine in its own right, and I suspect we'll explore it in a future episode. I got the first installer disk dropped into the PowerBook and turned it on, but the machine just ejected it and booted from its hard drive instead. I reinserted it, but it just said the disk was unreadable. I tried another disk, but got the same thing. This meant the drive itself was having problems, so I had to take the laptop apart again. I disconnected the flat flex cables between the floppy and hard drives and the motherboard, then took out the screws holding down the metal bracket. The hard drive lifted out with it, then the floppy was next. A little gentle prying got the drive's top cover to pop free. I had to remove the top PCB, which meant disconnecting all of the ribbon cables leading to it three on one side and one on the other. Then it was just a single Phillips screw holding the board down, and I could hinge it up and out of the way, being mindful of the two additional ribbons connected on the bottom. The most likely culprit here was the mechanism that moves the heads forwards and back. The lubricant on this screw assembly can turn sticky over time and keep it from moving smoothly. I applied some fresh lithium grease using a swab, and while I was at it, I delicately cleaned the read-write heads with some isopropyl alcohol. Then I could reassemble the drive and get the PowerBook put back together. In the past, this has gotten cranky floppy drives working for me again. But sadly, not this time. 
The machine still just says discs are unreadable, and listening closer, it doesn't sound like the drive heads are even trying to move. My guess is that the motor has failed, but since I don't have a spare drive on hand, fixing this will have to wait for another time. When the original PowerBook 145 was released, it garnered decent reviews, but not much excitement. It was meant to replace the PowerBook 100 subnotebook, which itself was a rather low-end machine. When the 145B replaced the 145, it got even less attention. The only new thing about it was its lower price tag of about $1,600, so reviews mostly complained about the minor cost-cutting moves Apple made, like not including an external microphone or OS restore floppies in the box. What didn't help either was that it had launched alongside the high-end PowerBook 180C, the first Mac laptop with an Active Matrix color screen. But while the 145B's passive matrix black and white display didn't offer the best experience, these days it's turned into a bit of an asset. PowerBooks with monochrome active matrix screens, like the 170 and 180, have lately started suffering from an effect where the outer edges of the display become unusable. This so-called tunnel vision problem gets worse over time, and the best theory so far is that it's due to moisture getting in between the glass layers of the screen from failed adhesive. Some owners have tried baking their displays in the oven in an attempt to drive out the moisture, and while this can help, the results are usually fleeting, with the problem returning a short time later. But passive matrix screens, at least so far, seem to be immune. I often like to upgrade the retro computers in my collection with more RAM, a bigger hard drive, or other parts that were optional accessories. But I feel like I'm content leaving this PowerBook in stock form. It was meant to be a mainstream laptop, and it's likely that many of them went without ever having gotten an upgrade. In that way, it's a great time capsule of sorts. Not necessarily the best that computing had to offer at the time, but rather what the computing experience was like for the average user. The PowerBook 145B wasn't the fastest or most feature-rich laptop you could get in 1993, but to those who bought them, it likely got the job done. And sometimes, that's all you really need. If you liked the video, I'd appreciate a thumbs up and be sure to subscribe. You can follow me on social media at thisdoesnotcomp. And as always, thanks for watching.